We are done with analyzing uh, categorical data. So now we are going to analyze data which are scale or those are continuous data. So the first thing that we are going to discuss is how are we going to uh, compare means. So that is comparing means on, on data which are continuous. So we will be talking here of t-test and the analysis of variance so that is the content of this lesson it's more of the t-test and the analysis of variance because these two statistical tests are the commonly used test statistic for comparing means okay so when we are going to summarize means we have to look for uh, outliers and the summary statistics okay so and then we are going to use the box plot or the confidence interval plot if we are going to look for uh, outliers so this is done by the use of the SPSS when we are going to use the MS Excel uh, it cannot graph this box plot so uh, excel is limited only to do computations but on the graphical uh, outputs as a summary of the means uh, it is not capable so when we are interested in comparing two data sets uh, before we are going to uh, dive into the analysis we are going to look into whether the data is uh, paired or independent. And of course, when we are going to compare two population means, we are using a t-test. And if the data is paired, meaning to say uh, they are of same individual studied at two different times or under two different conditions, then... Uh, that is a paired t-test. It can be done in an Excel. It can also be done in the SPSS. And if data is collected from two separate groups, they are really independent of each other, then we are going to use an independent samples t-test. Okay, so if we are going to take a look at this example of paired and independent situation when we are going to compare means, so this is on the comparison of hours worked in 1988 until today. So if the same people have reported their hours worked for 1988 and until 2014, they have paired measurements and we are using this is a paired uh, t-test so how are we going to state the null hypothesis in a paired t-test we would say that the mean of the paired differences is equal to zero so the mean difference is equal to zero and if different people are used in 1988 and until 2014 they are independent measurements. So how do we state our independent null hypothesis? We would say that the mean hours worked in 1988 is equal to the mean hours worked in 2014. So again, if you take a look very clearly or carefully on the stating of the null hypothesis between a paired and an unpaired or the independent samples t-test, when the paired, you would say that the mean difference is the mean of the paired differences mu sub d is equal to zero. There is no difference at all. And if you are going to state the null for two independent samples or the independent t-test, you would say that uh, the mean in the first group is not equal to the mean is equal to the mean in the uh, second group. That's how null hypothesis no difference at all. So what is the t distribution? 
So the T distribution is similar to the standard normal distribution but has an additional parameter called degrees of freedom or uh, it is mostly uh, used notation for degrees of freedom is the DF. So the degrees of freedom is calculated as the number of observations minus 1 and is often referred to as V in many uh, tables. So if it is on table, uh, it is referred to as V. But if we are going to write it, it is uh, denoted as DF. So when we have small sample sizes, that is uh, n is less than 30, we replace the normal distribution with a student's t distribution which has slightly less probability of being close to the mean and a somewhat larger probability of being in the tails. So as you increase your sample size, the critical values tend towards uh, normality Example for that is the two-tailed test with the 5% significance and the critical uh, value gets closer to 1.96 as sample size is being increased. So that is how it looks like the relationship of the T distribution to the normal distribution. Okay, so the normal curve is the uh, the black one. So with the DF equal to 1, that is in orange, and as you increase your DF and it as it approaches to infinity, then it matches the normal distribution. Okay, let us have this example. Okay, so... So we have this example one in terms of triglycerides. So in a weight loss study, triglyceride levels were measured at baseline. And again, after eight weeks of being on the new weight loss program. So the two uh, points of measurement at baseline. So before the weight loss program, the triglyceride levels are measured. And after taking the uh, weight loss program on the eighth week, the triglyceride levels were also uh, measured. So how do we state a Warnall hypothesis? That is, this is a paired t-test. So we're going to test, uh, we're going to state a Warnall hypothesis. That means uh, the mean difference on the pre and the post is equal to zero meaning to say there is no uh, difference at all and if we get a p value which is greater than uh, 0 0.05 that means we do not reject the null hypothesis there is no uh, difference and if we take a look at this one, this is an output of an SPSS. So you have the mean, you have the standard deviation. So those are the summary statistics that you also need to report. You have your confidence interval of the difference. You have your computed T that is negative 0.837. Degrees of freedom is 34 and your... Uh, Significance in two-tailed test is 0 0.408 and it is since it is greater than 0 0.05 then there is no difference at all. So the triglyceride levels, uh, the, in, the decrease in that from the baseline to after the eighth week of the a weight loss program it has no difference at all on example two on the weight loss so weight loss has measured after taking uh, either a new weight loss treatment or a placebo for eight weeks so you have your treatment gr treatment groups the one receiving the placebo and the one 
taking in the new drugs. There are 19 participants in the placebo group and 18 in the new drug group. And you have the mean for the placebo is negative 1.36 and on the new drug is negative 5.01. Standard deviation for the placebo group is 2.148, while for the new drug is 2.722. And if we are going to run SPSS on that, okay, so that's how it looks like. You have your uh, null hypothesis, so you would say there is no difference on the uh, weights of those in the new drug the, and on the one in the placebo group. Okay, so if we take a look at the P, it is less than 0 0.05. So, reject the null. There is uh, evidence that there is really a difference in the weight loss between treatment and the placebo group. Now, if you are going to look at the assumptions of the t-test, okay, so one assumption is the normality. So, you have to have to plot the histogram. Okay, so one plot of the pair differences for any pair data. So, you are using that. Two, oh, okay, so one for each group for independent samples. And don't have it to be perfect, just roughly asymmetric. That is if we are going to use the normality plots. Okay, but then you can I, you can do away with the normality plot, but you can use uh, the Shapiro-Wilk and the kolmogorov smirnovs as your measures of normality. Also, you can compare equal uh, population variances. Okay, so you compare sample standard deviations as a rough estimate. One should be uh, no more than twice the other. So if you do an F-test, that is the Levin's test in SPSS, so formally uh, test the differences. So that's the one that we're looking into the Levin's test of uh, normality for the Assumptions between uh, t test in t test. However, the t test is very robust to violations of the assumptions of normality and equal variances. So, particularly for moderate, that is, you have greater than 30 sample sizes, and for larger sample sizes. And with these uh, histograms, as you can see, the that really uh, look normal. Okay, so for smaller groups, it's uh, hard to tell. Okay, so the histogram on the left is indicating a problem, but those on the right are approximately normally distributed. So if you look at the left, it is skewed. Okay, it has a longer right tail. But if you look at the one in the second and the third, they are approximately normal. And looking at the Levin's test for equal variances uh, from the example number two, if you look at the equal variances under Levin's test for equality of variances, you notice that the significance is 0.136. Okay, so... Uh, Levin's test work and that it's not a problem if the assumption of equal variances is, re is rejected. Uh, we simply use the second row in the table. So, in the table, if it is rejected on the first one, okay, so the t-test results for the difference between the means. So, you are going to look into that Levin's test of... Uh, equal, for equal variances. So, the null hypothesis is that the population variances are equal. Okay, so that is the variance of the new and the placebo are the same. So, since we have what we have there, the significance is 
the p value is 0 0.136 and so it is greater than 0 0.05 we do not reject the null that is we can assume that they are of equal variances but if it is not significant this column is not significant then you're going to use the uh, once the results in the equal variance is not assumed. So, if the significance here is 0 0.001, that means we reject the null hypothesis. So, we are going to use the values found in the second row where equal variances are not assumed. Okay, what if the assumptions are not met? So, there are alternative tests which do not have these assumptions. So, uh, for independent t-test, you will check histograms of data by group. And if, if normality is not met, then you are going to use its non-parametric equivalent, which is the Mann-Whitney. For the paired t-test, if the normality assumption is not met, then you are going to use the Wilcoxon signed rank test. And you have to consider also the sampling variation. Okay, so every sample taken from a population will contain different numbers so the mean really varies and which estimate is the most reliable okay so it's still the mean if it is normally distributed but if the data is non-normal so what estimate is reliable is the median so for normally distributed data the reliable estimate are the means and the standard deviation, but for data which are non-normally distributed, then we are going to report the median and the IQR that is a more reliable. And of course, if we would like to uh, be confident on our data on, the, on its sampling distribution, then we have to construct also confidence intervals. So confidence intervals are those range of values within which we are confident in terms of probability that the true value of the population parameter lies. So we've been repeating this one that if you have a 95% confidence interval that is interpreted as the 95% of the time, the CI would contain the true value of the population uh, parameter. That is 5% of the time, the confidence interval would fail to contain the true value of the population parameter. And if we're looking at the triglycerides example, Okay, so you have there the confidence interval that's negative 38.976 to 16.233. And our mean is negative 11.371. Okay, so if we are going to look at it, the true mean weight of... Uh, the weight loss would be between uh, 2 kilograms to 5 kilograms with the new uh, treatment. So this is always positive, hence the hypothesis test rejected the null that the difference is uh, zero. Now what about if we are going to compare means of several uh, groups? Okay, so t-test is only applicable for two groups. And if we go beyond two groups, we are comparing now three groups. It is wrong that you are going to pair and pair. So you do uh, so many t-tests. But what you will do is you are going to use uh, analysis of variance. So one-way analysis of variance. So that is used when you are going to compare the means of several groups. So, which diet is best? 
Your dependent uh, variable here is the weight lost. So that is a scale variable and your independent is the diet one, two, three. So those are nominal. So your null hypothesis is going to be stated as the mean weight lost on diets one, two, three is the same. So the mean of group one, group two, and group three are all equal. And your alternative hypothesis would be the mean weight lost on diets one, two, three are not all the same. So at least one of the means are different and you have to take note that if you found a significant difference then you have to do a post hoc analysis that means you are going to look into which pairs of groups really have the difference so the post hoc analysis is what you call your data autopsy you're going to autopsy your data and try to look further which among the groups shows the uh, difference on means and that is how a summary statistics would look like you have your mean the overall the diet one two three standard deviation and the number in the group or sometimes uh, they are going to lump all of them for the interest of space when it is going to be a publishable article they are going to uh, lump them all together. So, uh, there are 24 who are in the diet 1, 24 persons. In the diet 2, 27 persons. And in the diet 3, you have 27 persons. Uh, the mean and the standard deviation for diet 1 is 3.3 plus minus 2.24. For the diet 2, 3.03 plus minus 2.52. And the diet 3 is 5.15 plus minus 2.4. And the overall, you have 3.85 plus minus 2.55. The overall number of respondents in this diet program is 78. Although in the diet 1, they only have 24. And we are asked to find which diet was best and are the standard deviations similar. So how does ANOVA work? So although ANOVA compares means, ANOVA also stands for the analysis of variance. So this is because it compares uh, between group variation to within a uh, group variation to decide if there is a difference so the variance in the population can be split into uh, two parts variation due to group treatment or variation due to group or treatment which we can call the mean square due to treatments and the uh, uh, natural variation we expect between uh, people which we call within group variation or that is the mean square due to error. Okay, so again, the variance in the population can be split into two. That is the variation due to group or treatment, which we call the mean square. That is due to treatment. And the natural uh, variation we expect between people, we call the within group variation. So these are the two sources of variation. So when you are asked, what are the sources of variation in the ANOVA? That is the within group and the uh, between group uh, error. Okay, so if you look at the residual, Okay, difference on individual and other group mean. Okay, so you have that. The between group variation, you have three, uh, diet three difference is 1.3, that's higher. Overall mean is 3.85. So, uh, by, by manual computation, of course, that's how it looks like. But if you are going to use the SPSS, that's how it would look like also. 
and if we're using manual and filling the boxes by hand we are going to use that but actually there are other ways on how to report uh, outputs of analysis of variance when uh, when you are using the SPSS. So the p-value of for ANOVA is calculated using the F distribution that is the one on the table but that is uh, I mean tricky part. So I am just showing you how it is done manually so doing an analysis of variance is very lengthy that's why we will not use that so instead we are going to use the uh, SPSS in which I will be showing you also through a another lecture okay so uh, somewhat it looks like that okay so the test statistic is 6.197 and this is the MS between the source of variation and the MS within. So if you are going to take a look at that, there was a significant, looking at the 0 0.03 in the significant column, 0 0 0.003, there was a significant difference in weight loss between the uh, diets. And since there is a significant difference, that's the one I told you, you're going to perform a post hoc test. So when running SPSS, you're going to uh, check already the post hoc test so that whether you will have a significant difference or not, uh, at least you already have run your post hoc test. And the most common uh, post hoc test is the Tukey and Shifts test or the Hoopsbirds GT2. Okay, Tukey's and Shifts test are the most commonly used post hoc tests for ANOVA, while Hoopsbirds GT2 is better where the sample sizes for the groups are very different because sometimes sample sizes for each group uh, differs. And you have this uh, post hoc uh, test results. So how are you going to take a look at that? If you're going to take a look at it, the one that differs is on diet 2 and 3 and diet 1 and 3 and 3 and 2. two. Okay, so yeah, 1 and 3, 2 and 3. So if you look at it on a table in a pairwise comparison, uh, looking at the p-values, so for diet 1 versus diet 2, there is no significant difference because it's 0.912 the p-value, but for diets 1 and 3 and 2 and 3, that's one I mentioned, their p-values show that they are uh, different. So it's 0 0.02 and 0 0.005. And what are the assumptions of ANOVA? So there is also normality, the residual uh, difference between observed and expected values should be normally distributed. And what if it is uh, not normal, then what you will do is you will use its non-parametric equivalent, then that is Kruskal Wallis test. And if you're going to check assumption on homogeneity of variance, each group should have a similar standard deviation, and that is using the uh, Levin's test. And what if assumptions are not met, so you're going to use the Welsh test instead of ANOVA and the game, games how well for post hoc, or uh, basically you do Kruskal Wallis. Can equal variances be assumed? Looking at that, okay, so you have your p-value which is 0.52, so that means do not reject. And equality of variances is assumed. 
using also this uh, plot on the residuals can normality be assumed? Yes, and we are going to use analysis of variance. 